I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> No, I miss you, but oh my God, I was like, I teach an 11 o'clock class and then I'm like, woo, I'm tired and I'm hungry. So this, your new format makes me happy. So um, I thought we'd just get started and before people pop in, they can pop in as we go. But the idea was to have the theme of back this week and kind of your best or favorite exercises for the back. And I was curious to see if I threw that out there so general. If I threw that out there, what everyone would come up with. So I'll start with what, what I think about when I think about the back. Coming from the rehab, rehab background, I'm always thinking of decompressing the spine. And the two ways that I like to decompress the spine the most one is to find deeper abdominals working to give the spine support so that the back can shut down a little bit and relax. Um, I think what happens or what I see or feel that happens a lot is that we get in this bad pattern because of any number of things. It could be just posture over time. It could be accident or pain. And then our deep abdominal, the uh, multifidus in the back and then the deep abdominals and the front transverse abdominals tend to shut off when we have that happen. So either over time slowly with just kind of degrading posture or after an injury. So um, I'm always, if we get those deep abdominals and multifidus to work, I feel like we get a really good base and we get lots of support for the back and then any sort of spasming or discomfort can settle. So that's one of, one of my things. And the other one is decompressing the spine more with lengthening and tractioning. So, and I actually have to say, I've been teaching more and more just, just that. I've been trying to find more and more ways to, to coach people into lengthening their spines. So um, my, I'm gonna take you into coccyx curl. You're welcome to do it or watch or just listen or whatever feels right for you at this moment. Um, but I'll take you through it, and I'm, I'm going to cue it differently than sort of is standard, so that I can explain why I do it that way, and maybe it can be a choice for you, depending on who you're working with, if you want to do it that way or not. So let me take you to coccyx curl, and I typically, um, personally, I don't, for me, I feel comfortable with my knees touching each other, but I think more people don't feel that comfortable with their knees all the way touching, so Using a little ball, block, pillow, prop in between the knees usually gives space. So, and it gives space to the IT band as well. So, um, we don't have to, if, you, if the knees come together and somebody has a tight IT or has really anything dysfunctional at the hip, that knees together can already create stress. And that's not stress that we need. And to get a really good deep abdominal contraction, we actually need a tiny bit of pelvic floor. And using a, something between the knees will give that tiny bit of pelvic floor. So if I come down on the back and I just have them rest for a minute, I like to really differentiate the breathing in neutral from the coccyx curl because I feel like people don't understand that differential and I think they're two completely different things. So just here, if you would uh, take a breath in and then exhale, and just uh, hopefully, as I should have said first, hopefully you landed in that neutral spine position. So if you land in the neutral spine, um, I'm gonna take a breath in and exhale. I'm just gonna let my belly drop down to match my neutral spine position. So I have work happening in both directions enough, and it's not kill it, squash it work, it's just hello, I'm here and I'm supportive kind of work. So taking a breath in, as I exhale, ribcage sinks, belly's dropping, pelvic floor now kicks in. As I, um, if I give a little bit of a squeeze, and just as I drop that belly, I should feel like there's a lightening in the pelvic floor. Definitely not a pressure downward towards my feet, right? Really more lightening and upward, and that's enough uh, of a pelvic floor contraction. And then you're gonna inhale and exhale. Belly's dropping, spine holding neutral, little squeeze at that ball, little pelvic floor lift. Right, so then that would be just a standard, that would be how we want posture in life. 
walking around and functionally. If we want to emphasize or strengthen coccyx curl is a great way to do that. It's also a great way to lengthen and traction the spine. So if we're just going for strength, I would cue it as taking a breath in and exhaling, finding that breathing in neutral, same thing, low belly pulling in. And then I'm going to keep that exhale going, but I'm going to keep dropping my stomach as much as I can. And when I get far enough, I'm going to start to feel that a kind of a start of a coccyx curl. And then I'll engage my glutes and roll into the coccyx curl. And then I'll unroll back down. So here I find that if you start with the glutes, you end up with just glutes. I can do a coccyx curl with just glutes and not really do anything with my abs. And so if we're talking about back, that's not the pattern that I want. If, if we were just talking about glute strength, maybe that would be the pattern. So let's try again, taking a breath in, exhaling. Low belly is dropping down. Little squeeze on that ball just sort of automatically helps that pelvic floor out. Keep the belly pulling down enough that I start to feel my back flatten. And then continue that motion with the tail curling. So if I, if I was going for strength, that would be exactly the right cue. If I'm going for length or uh, unloading of the spine, then I would add that lengthening idea. So taking a breath in, exhaling, low belly is pulling down. Now I'm going to tell somebody, okay, now I want you to imagine that my hip bones, the tops of my hips are pulling away from the back. So like my sit bones and tail are reaching long away from me, pulling away as I curl upward. And then I'm going to hold that full waist, stretch my spine, rolling its way back down. So there's a couple of ways to self-cue that. One is to take the hands at the thighs, right hand at the hip crease, I put the base of my hand at the hip crease, and have them, as we go through this, take a breath in, exhale, the belly drops. I start putting pressure at my hips, and as I'm curling up, I'm caressing away with my thighs, coccyx curl, and then I'm going to keep pressing those hands away as I unroll from the root cage down all the way until I release all the way back to neutral. So it feels pretty nice to have some length there. The other way, and the way that um, I think is a little less, uh, more subtle, but I, more accurate, is actually taking a breath in. My hands are now at the top of my uh, posterior iliac crest, so right in the back of my pelvis. And I'm going to take a breath in, exhale, pressing down through here. And then I sort of slide my hands down towards my glutes. And then as I'm rolling down, I'm pulling my glutes kind of pulling all my meat away, creating length on that way down as I go. So it creates a lot of length and space and so I should feel good. Um, most people can tolerate that. Some people who are really like acute, if they have an acute disc thing, you wouldn't be rolling that much. So maybe not. They might actually prefer this sort of pressure away and then less of a roll up and down with that pressure than the grabbing kind of behind and curling into that pressure. So that those are my actual favorite cueing exercises for functional back health um, for me. So I will pass that on to whoever wants to, to, to share what they think or what they use. Um, so for me, um, it's hard to not have the equipment <laughs> to do <laughs> to do things. So uh, for me, it's it's going back to opening up my chest and engaging these muscles with um, replicating the chest expansion or the bent arm rowing. So I've been using the TheraBand. I'm, you can stand, but I'm going to kneel so I don't have to change my camera angle. All right. And then just, um, sit, you know, kneeling up tall, right? Focusing on dropping the shoulders down. I tend to close my eyes a lot when I do this. Um, and then I have a little tension just on the, just a little tension on the TheraBand and then pulling slightly back beyond my legs just to let those shoulders drop down. And I'm not, I'm not going to go very far for me because I, then I start to work in my neck right, right away. I'm like, okay, neck needs to help. Right, so I've been cueing um, uh, similar to I know Zaina and, and, and some of you others, 
is to pull back just a little and open the palms towards the front of the room or in front of you to really open up the shoulders. And that does actually help me draw the shoulder blades down the back and open up my chest. And of course, those of you that know me know that I'm always trying to work on opening here. So that's, you know, not uh, something you guys all know, I know. Um, the other thing I've been trying to do without, I I'm saw sorry, this somewhere. Can, just really quickly, can you cue yeah. it if you were in a class? Oh, okay, sorry, okay. That would make it, yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, okay, so go ahead and um, place the TheraBand across your thighs. All right, and then grab it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and grab it between my thumb and my forefinger with just a little bit of tension on it. My hands, my palms are facing my body to start. So uh, have your palms facing your body. All right, go ahead and visualize those shoulder blades traveling down, opening your chest. Take an inhale. And then on the exhale, pull the, the TheraBand back and I, just an inch or two, um, just to feel those shoulders drop and the chest open. Good. So you want to have, um, I think for me, I, I have a fair bit of tension, not too much. It's a pretty tight across my lap. Um, yeah, good. And then pull back again, opening up the palms to face the front of the room or the, the direction that you're facing. Keeping the wrists nice and straight. Fingertips either wrapping around the band. Keep going. Do a few more. Pull back. But definitely wrists, wrists straight. Elbows straight. Not a big motion, range of motion at all. Good. Yep. And just one more here. All right, pulling back turning the palms to the front, to where you're facing, opening up the chest, dropping the shoulders. Good, okay? So that's something I've been doing, which I've seen others do. And the other is trying to replicate bent arm rowing. So take your TheraBand without having an anchor. Take your TheraBand and I, um, go ahead and fold it in half. And then you wanna have maybe about three inches in between your two hands, grabbing your hands, palms down, facing down, and then bring your arms out to about chest height or even a little bit lower, making sure that we don't wanna go up too high, scrunching the shoulders. And then go ahead and begin to bend your elbows back, pulling on the band as you bring it towards your chest, right? So bring those elbows uh, out to the side and back, and then release, straighten your arms out in front, and then on the next breath, exhale, pull the, pull the band slightly, you can pull it a little more as you bend your elbows and draw your hands in towards your chest. Good, and then inhale, release, and straighten your arms, exhale, pull back again, and inhale, release, and just one more time. Exhale, pull the band apart, Sh elbows out wide, All right? Shoulders traveling and wrapping down, and that's it. Those are my two new favorites with the TheraBand. Can I, can I say something about the rowing? Another, yes. Give you another way for that rowing without an anchor? Yeah. The um, bent elbow rowing, I've been doing it in um, either half kneel and yep. rowing here. Yep. Or in lunge, which is even better, and rowing here. So if you wanted to uh, mimic that without having an anchor point, I found those work really well too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've done those too. I've just okay. picked two, <laughs> so yeah. They do work really well though. Yeah. Anyone else wanna have any comments about that one or wanna take it away and share what you have? I'll take it away. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Um, so I was gonna um, try this out 
on my Saturday club, the, I think the level two, three class, but um, it's just our ball we're going to use. And it's just, um, cause I, I mean, I find for myself that I guess that I sometimes even in the coccyx curl um, or the, um, yeah, even the bridging, like I just find it's hard to just really relax and find length. So it's almost, a, I use it as a prop to kind of get some length. Um, and it also provides some uh, challenge with your stability too. So I'm just putting the ball, I'm laying down and I'm putting the ball right like under my tailbone. Um, and I also like the ball, I guess in this position, maybe better than the roller, just because I am so flexible. I feel like I like just kind of slouch into the roller sometimes and it, it gets a little uncomfortable in my neck. So just have the ball at your um, tailbone, your arms down by your side. And we're just going to, so think of what you were kind of springboarding a little bit on you, what you were talking about, like getting length and feeling the contraction in the abs for the coccyx curl. Um, just kind of putting those together. So inhaling and exhaling, letting the belly really drop and then rotating the hips up towards your coccyx curl. And I find here, and you, you feel like you got a lot of length and some space in the joints, and then go back to more of a neutral. So you might have to play around with the placement of the ball a little bit. I just, this is, I haven't really tried this out. I'm just trying it on you guys for the first time. So feedback's encouraged. And then inhale. And exhale, using your belly to rotate your hips. Feel the hollowing of the belly, feeling some pressure on the ball in your um, right at your tailbone. And then inhale. Okay, and then just take a check to your feet, feeling that the weight is even in both of your feet because you are using the ball. Inhale, exhale. And I'm just gonna bring my hands onto my thighs a little bit and try to get some more length from that coccyx curl. Okay, and then coming back to neutral. And so that would be what I would do for the coccyx curl. And then I, to get some more stability in the torso and also because I'm so flexible, my hips just want to do crazy things sometimes. So um, it would be just, we're working on single legs. I find this is a nice supported, like intermediary between like, full single leg bridge and then um, like both legs, at least for me. So weight is on my left foot. I'm gonna bring my right leg up to tabletop. Okay, and then I'm gonna bring that leg down, focusing on keeping the ball balanced. Oh, my hips are going everywhere today. And then feeling the weight in the right foot and bringing the left foot up to tabletop. And then bring the foot down. And then other side again. And I'm feeling the weight on my standing leg and like the ball of the foot, the big toe, feeling the energy in the arch of the foot. So translate that into the right foot as you bring the left foot back up. And then bring both feet down. And that's what I was um, been working on. So um, that's what I got. Thanks. I really like that. That feels great. Um, Does it? Okay, awesome. You can um, stand on that with that. Yeah. yeah. So once you feel like they're already, like they're, like they feel like they got their groove, you can uh -huh. challenge them by taking their arms up. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. 
because that'll make the, where the foundation is less now. So they really have to focus on, on balance and core. Balance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Teresa. Appreciate oh, it. You're welcome. And I also say put it the ball where your butt crack starts. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will say the plumber's crack. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I'll go next. Okay. Um, Nancy, thank you. <laughs> Genevieve, sorry. I have to figure out how to switch my name on this thing. Um, so I was going to kind of do a little bit of mobility stuff. I may not be able to do all of it because Zana just attacked my back with some cupping. So um, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, bear with me here. Um, but I was going to kind of take things into some basic cat cow. Um, and then flowing through a little bit, um, using ways to both lengthen the back and try and, and um, uh, create some, some stretch there, but also then subtly engage it. Um, let me see if I can uh, angle this out a bit. Okay, so starting in quadruped, um, I really like to be very um, intentional about how we do cat-cow. So I like to find neutral first, kind of pressing down into the floor with the palms and puffing up the spot between the shoulder blades. And then from there, lengthening the spine out through top of head and tail to create that really nice kind of bound energy. Um, and then from there, start by exhaling and drawing the belly button up toward the spine. And then allowing the head to drop. And then passing through neutral as you inhale, coming into your cow. And I really like putting the cow just in the upper back here. So kind of rolling the shoulder blades together and reaching the sternum forward, keeping a little um, engagement in the low belly to create a little length for the low back there. So that's my sort of modification for Cat cow is really kind of um, cueing belly button for the cat and shoulder blades and sternum for the cow. So just rolling through a few of these. And then on the next uh, cat, taking the cat and then pulling the belly button even further back into the child's pose. So really trying to reach the tail down toward the heels and the belly button backward. And then using the belly button again, pulling that upward toward the ceiling to come back into your neutral. And so I find a lot of um, abdominal engagement there with that transition going through to child's pose and then lifting with the belly button into neutral. And so just passing through that a few more times. And then coming up and tucking the toe, coming into a down dog. So lifting the tail toward the ceiling and kind of lengthening there. And then the progression from there would be from down dog, curling the tail, rolling through plank, and doing that same progression. Um, walking it back a little bit, coming back into the uh, child's pose to cat, or child's pose to quadruped. <clears throat> um, Cueing from the belly button is one way to go. And I, I've tried this before in classes where we do a few like that and then we reverse it so that sort of we're lifting from the belly button but creating a little lift in the tail coming up and then guiding back with the tail. So the belly, so the belly is coming in but the tail is directing you back. And then that I find just creates a little bit of activation in the spinal extensors in a really gentle way and kind of guides you in sort of a more neutral spine. 
And you can even feel a little bit of the booty working there too, putting the brakes on, bringing the tail back. I think that was it. <laughs> I don't know if that was useful for everybody, but. Well, that was great. Thanks, Genevieve. Yeah. That transition there. When you go into the, the like, are your, um, what am I, the child's pose-ish thing, are your knees together or are they separated? I keep them a little bit separate. Um, okay. I like having them still underneath me so that it's facilitating the rounding a little bit. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Um, so if I go too far out, then I feel like I'm kind of, it becomes more of a hip stretch than a back stretch. Right, okay. okay. Yeah, but I mean, depending on what you're after. Right, yeah, okay, cool, thanks. I'm sorry, that was awesome, thank you, but since I'm not seeing you, can you cue it? Like, we're- Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, sorry, let me do a little progression here. From quadruped, going from all fours into your cat, drawing the belly button up toward the ceiling. Coming back through neutral, reaching the chest forward, rolling the shoulder blades back into cow. And moving through this about five or so times, moving with your breath so that exhale draws the belly button in. Inhale, rolls the shoulder blades together. Exhale, draws the belly button in. Inhale, rolls the sh shoulder blades together. Last one here. And then from your next cat, we're gonna come up into that belly button up position and then keep driving the belly button up and back toward the wall behind you, reaching your tail toward your heels to come into child's pose. And then with the belly button lifting up, come back into neutral spine quadruped. And again, exhale, belly button lifts, reaches back, sits into child's pose. Coming up, back into neutral spine. One more like that. Back up into neutral. And then leading with the tail, keep drawing the belly button inward, but create a little length through the sits bones, reaching the tail back onto the heels again, once more into child's pose. And again, start lifting that tail up and shifting your weight forward once more. And again, shifting the sits bones back and coming back to quadruped once more. Last one. Actually, another thought comes to me here. You could then start trying to roll through the spine so that you could lead with the tail, coming back into child's pose, and then lift with the belly button coming forward so that you're kind of creating a little undulation through your spine. And then reverse that, leading up with the tail, driving back with the belly button. And on this next one, coming into quadruped, we're going to tuck the toes under, lift the tail up, and come into uh, a down dog-like position. Tucking the tail, pulling the belly button up, shift forward into your plank. Belly button draws up, shifts the hips back into your quadruped, or into your uh, down dog. And then belly button comes forward into your plank. Last one. And then bringing the knees down. Okay. Can I be 
piggyback on that? Yeah. Um, I um, I love that undulating downward dog into the plank, and I've taken it just reminding people about the snake exercise, and then even into like a little arabesque. So I love those for the back. I love planks for the back and all what Jody did. And then if you wanted to get a step further, if you want to try, you know, talk you through, but so if you went back to that downward dog. And then you're going to come up. I've been teaching people to try to get the belly really active, come up on the toes without going forward, so that the belly goes up to the ceiling, and then curl the tail, find that plank. And then the snake here opens up the chest with the legs super strong, so we can get that upper shoulder blade squeeze that Jenny did on all fours, but here in that plank. And then tuck the chin fully finding your way back. That could be one version. And then the more progressed would be crossing one leg behind the other, going forward into that, rolling through, cross this lead, leading, opening to snakes with chest open, but tummy tight, legs strong. And then as I tuck the chin and come back, I take the leg up to the sky. And then close the leg as I come inward, open into snake, chest open, and then coming up, taking that leg up, and then you could take it down, switching sides, so crossing the other leg behind. Really tight through the legs, hips go forward, coccyx curling your way, into snake here, opening shoulders open, chest open, and then tuck the chin, belly lift, and leg extends to the sky, and then closing it down, rolling those hips forward, coccyx curling your way, Open the chest, shoulders, strong, strong leg. And then tucking, rolling back, leg up to the sky, and then foot can come down and back to your knees down. Yeah. That's it, yeah. So it sort of combines the snake and the plank arabesque from the reformer, from the plank series, which I love. So there's just so many steps and levels to this, from kneeling all the way up. To that and then eventually to that Pilates full push up with the single leg or a vest. So it's just a great, it's a great progression and all really great for core stability. Well, tip is actually working when the leg's picking up a lot. Um, so that's a great way to access that as well. Hey, can I just ask you uh, just a quick add on on that? You know, sometimes in yoga classes, you see people like, okay, now. Bring that leg up and out. Do you think that would be too much for like the clientele here, just as far as stability wise? Uh, so you know, it's um, adding rotation, and then the you know, the Pilates version of that is put down, right? So then yoga yoga version, if I understand it right, I don't pretend that I know yoga super well, but coming up and then opening the hip, trying yes. to get hip but opening. The Pilates version is to go from side planking, leg, oops, leg behind, and opening up this way. So we have it in our repertoire to the same. Um, the Pilates version, I think, a little more stability because the foot's on the floor with that rotation and extension, whereas uh, the yoga version more hip opening. So I think you just have to judge based on your clientele. I, I've heard really great yoga teachers saying, you know, when you go to open the hip, try not to open the pelvis and put all your weight on arm, but try and keep square and open the hip. But I doubt that most people do it properly. Yeah, it's a it's a very, yeah, a lot of moving parts. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a doubt that people stay square when they do it. But mm -hmm. um, I think if it's not, I think it's an okay thing as long as, Maybe you would say to people who have an unstable pelvis, you know, if this is too much or you feel unstable here, just take the leg up, or if you can't even do that, um, just hold in the downward dog, you know, whatever, whatever or a three-legged dog. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah. Um, so kind of like Zena, I come to this with a very rehab-oriented perspective. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on upper spine, so cervical posture and thoracic posture and strength and endurance there to work on combating forward head. And then also just 
um, to hint onto my favorite way to teach bird dog and multifidae activation, which again is um, the people that I work with are people that are recovering to get back to normal, typically, not necessarily going from normal to even better. So the first um, things I want to talk about are getting the head on top of the body, right? So just in standing or sitting, because so many of us, myself included, are forward to some degree, which changes all of the forces up and down through the spine. So I talk a lot with people about that, but one way to get more strength there is to work against gravity. So if you come into all fours, um, I do an exercise here, which is like this, which is for uh, not the back, but the shoulder. But I started doing it during this time thinking of, uh, sorry, this is my first time teaching this to someone else because I've just been doing it by myself. So what I'm the exercise here is to keep the elbows completely straight and to keep the spine itself in a neutral position and sink the chest down so that the shoulder blades slide together towards your spine and then push down through your palms, separating the shoulder blades away from your spine. So the movement here is really at the shoulder blades. It's not in the arm, it's not in the spine. So for me doing this at home recently, in the beginning, I thought of, okay, if I'm going to sink my chest down toward the floor. I'm going to simultaneously try to think of keeping the back of my head toward the ceiling and my length through my spine. So I start by bringing my, the back of my head and neck sort of up and back toward the sky. And then as I allow this motion through my shoulder blade, I continue to think of my head moving up. Um, I'm not sure how else to instruct that you guys I'm working on it. Any questions about that so far? <laughs> you stole my exercise and that was brilliant. I loved, um, I loved the, the back of the, um, the head as you lower down, that just changes everything. First of all, and, um, so I love that. So thank you for that. And um, and if I can expand on it, Frida, if you don't mind. Um, so I have also have a lot of clients that are, most of them are new to Pilates. So I have this exercise in three different variations. <clears throat> and I always, I have to give them a, a, a visual cue. So I always think of sliding glass doors, right? So their shoulder blades are sliding towards each other and then they're sliding away like you're going to the grocery store. And then um, I have them think about the pelvis, like in order to stay in neutral, I always have them think about like their suspenders right here. So they have suspenders on, so their suspenders can't get slacky, right? But I love the back of the head thing, so they'll do that. And then if people are feeling stronger, I'll have them come down and do it either on their knees or on their toes, doing the exact same thing lowering, sliding the glass doors. And then I will progress them up here to where they're doing it in a plank. So there's all those progressions. That's my newest favorite exercise, Frida. Awesome. Thank you for uh, your progressions too. Um, so I'm going to do another one, which, uh, so bird dog, right, or pointed dog, fires these little tiny muscles that go up and down the spine that their purpose is to rotate us, but here they're actually firing to keep us from rotating, right? So if we get into all fours, and I, I always take people through from the beginning, right? I don't assume that somebody can do more here until I see them do the beginning. So thinking here of reaching long through the back of the head, so that the head is not sinking down toward the floor or the mat at all. Your face is lifted pretty much as far as away from the floor as it can be with your face still facing the floor. So you're not facing forward, 
your eyes are gazing to approximately the area between your hands. So, I feel like th there's so much work here just posturally holding this position before we even get into reaching the arms or the legs, right? So that the head doesn't sink down and the chin doesn't go forward so that someone is gazing in front of them. I don't actually want to talk you through bird dog, but I just wanted to talk you through the setup for this, which I feel is critical when we're getting into posture, right? It's of course more challenging for someone to hold their head and neck in neutral posture here because we're working against gravity. But it's such great training for the strength and endurance of those muscles on the backside. Questions, comments on that? I love that because I can feel the imbalances. Just holding this is just like, damn. So that's really cool. So I can already feel the imbalances in like my shoulders and how I put more pressure on in the other. So I love that of just holding out and hanging out here. Because we're so quick to go into movement, right? So that's really cool. Thanks, Frida. Yeah, I, I almost always um, find when I go into teaching some sort of bird dog in classes, I want people to stay there in quadruped for a while. And like, I always feel like I'm staying there too long, but it's it's that that, you're right, that working against gravity where I'm like, this should be work and you should be feeling like you're working. But I'm always afraid that I'm making them stay there too long and they're getting bored. <laughs> and it's like about the foundation, the, like the bones of the pose, getting it right. Yeah, right. That's great. I, I actually also had one more thing um, for back to your sort of serratus press against the floor. Um, I, I actually tried this today with my class. Uh, just as like feedback for them a little bit, because we use the band doing serratus press on uh, supine on the floor, but I wanted to try it um, here on the mat in quadruped, sort of feeling the, um, the band pulling the shoulder mm -hmm. blades together a little bit in that, that uh, retraction moment, and then, feedback going, pressing into the band as you come into the press. Um, and I just found that to be kind of an interesting feeling. And I don't know if that's helpful for clients who, who have trouble finding that. Like, I feel like a, a lot of people do, um, so. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And then just one more thing to add on that at the other end of the body, something, I don't know if you guys notice this, but I think about this all the time and I should actually say it more, but when you're just setting up in the pose, I just always look between my legs to see like the perspective, you know, just to make sure my hips are even because sometimes one foot is showing more or the other and just kind of see that window back there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to say one more thing too about uh, bird dog or pointed dog, which is I was instructing it to a friend once at night and there were maybe one or two lights on in the room that we were in. So we could see our shadows fairly clearly because it was just, you know, a light bulb here and a light bulb there. And that was um, illuminating, so to speak. It was really cool because it's, <laughs> it was, um, it's so hard for me when I am in bird dog or plank to know where my body is because I can't see it, right? And in bird dog, when we're trying to limit the motion through the trunk and keep everything flat, we don't get a whole lot of sensory information from that part of our body, um, anatomically speaking or physiologically speaking. So it's really just hard to know what's going on back here. And I don't really like looking sideways into a mirror at least not very much. So if you're doing it in a dark room and you can see your shadow, essentially if your shadow is moving, you are moving, right? So obviously if we're teaching classes at noon or something, that's not applicable. But if this is something you're teaching someone to do at home, you can ask them to do it in that way. And, and not that they have to do it that way all the time, but it, it's just a useful feedback tool since it's so hard to see our position. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple more exercises, but I feel like we're getting out of time and I need to um, see if Teresa wants to teach another one. No, go. 
<laughs> Anybody else have more stuff? Oh, I just, I just have feedback on that last one. It's sort of just, just a, a bad uh, philosophical joke, but I could, I, you could call that the myth, the Plato's new myth of the cave, doing the pointed dog. The <laughs> I don't remember anything Plato, so. <laughs> or myths of caves. Probably a big, you know, a guy with an attitude a long time ago, so yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I'll do a couple more. And these come, um, one from my oldest and dearest yoga teacher and one from my first Pilates teacher. And they are in prone. So I don't, I don't typically teach Cobra to my, to my physical therapy patients. Um, I think there's a lot that can go wrong there and it's not necessary for most of the people that I work with. But my yoga teacher did want or several times teach me through doing Cobra in this way, so I'll teach you guys through it. So you're gonna lie down on your tummy with your forehead on the ground, so your chin is tucked, your forehead is down, and you should be able to breathe freely through your nose. Your nose should not be squished. And this is a position where the back of the head and neck are long and lengthened. So again, this is more yoga, right? but I think about lengthening through the crown of the head. So the soft spot on a baby's head is where the tallest part of our head would be. So thinking of that here, which is with that long lifted posture, even though you're lying on the ground. So Cobra, most people know is this position where you come up into sort of a back bend. The hands are on the floor. You can look at me if you want for a moment, but it's this arching away from the floor thing which people can get into in a lot of different ways. But if we're working on posture and head and neck alignment, this is one way to do it. So the first thing that I'm going to do from this position with my forehead down and the back of my neck long is I'm just going to lift my forehead about half an inch from the floor. And I'll hold that for a moment or two and then lower my forehead back down. We'll do that again, lifting. So my face is completely facing the floor. And then I just lower my head down. I'm not pushing through my hands or my arms at all. And I'm not, um, not tilting my face. So we can do that again and we'll lift the head away from the floor, half an inch, and then you can tilt your chin up just a few degrees really, so that my face is starting to look forward the tiniest bit. I'm gonna rotate my face back toward the floor and then lower my forehead. Doing that again, so lifting directly up from the floor and then tilting the chin up to look forward slightly. Rotating the chin and head back down, lowering the forehead. We'll start the same way, lifting the face from the floor, moving the head forward a bit, and then starting to lift the neck itself away from the floor. So not lifting the head more forward, but lifting the neck up toward the sky. Mm -hmm. Then lowering the whole head and neck down a bit, rotating the chin down, lowering the forehead. Are we good so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is something that in my yoga class, we went through this for, I don't know, eight or 10 minutes. So I'm even speeding a little bit here but I'll take it at one or two more steps. So we're here, arms again are relaxed. We're going to start with the back of the neck long, lifting the face from the floor, rolling the chin forward a touch, lifting the head and the neck up toward the sky. You can float your hands, make sure that you're not pushing through your arms. You place your hands, lower the head and the neck toward the floor, roll the chin back down, and lower the head. So 
we, we could take this further, getting into more of a traditional yoga cobra back bend situation. But I find that going through those slow repetitions of figuring out how we can move our head and neck in small ways and also keep integrity with our posture, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, it's not like gut busting work, but it's a lot of work in, if nothing else, postural awareness, even though we're here on the floor. So that's Yeah, that was thing. a lot of work. That was even just that. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thanks what, everybody so much. A little bit of feedback. Um, I really liked that uh, cueing to lengthen before lifting the face, but I found um, for me being somebody who's like got grabby back anyway, just the, that cue to lift the face made me go right into my back already. Mm. Um, and so I kind of was thinking how to, how to adjust that for myself. And I found thinking about lengthening so much that, let's see if I could like do this, hang on. <laughs> lengthening so much that, that it floats off, if that makes sense. Was, was the but you're almost encouraging more chin tuck. Is that what you're saying? I think, I think that's what I had to do for myself. And I may be one of those weird cases. I'm probably one of those weird cases, but <laughs> lengthening so much. Would it, so be much more, like, would it be more of like giving yourself like going into traction more if, if you're lengthening like that? It does feel a little bit like traction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you're reaching and like you're lengthening through your neck. Like, like a giraffe <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, for for some reason that idea and just letting the face float off instead of that cue to lift it off um i don't know if that will be useful in the future for people who are grabby backs like me but totally but yeah I really well, like thank you but i also wonder um genevieve is that your name it's yeah. not Nancy. yeah <laughs> um if like to not have it be so grabby in the back, if you activated the lower half by pressing down, right? So this is just not all like relaxed. And you're just focusing on this, but like this is like anchored as you lengthen and and then lift. Mm -hmm. I thank you for uh, saying that, Teresa, because that's something that I forgot to cue was basically doing a, a pelvic tilt or a coccyx curl here on the belly so that there is to whatever extent right but so that there is an activity in the abs and length through the lower spine as well which is something that's in my opinion lost in most yoga classes and a lot of classes too the other thing that helps me get out of the gravity back is um actually the Freely had her hand do locking here, which is great, but also um, not pushing with the hands, but pulling my body forward. And then, then I feel like I don't go so much wanting to grab my big back extensors. I'm not pushing with the floor, but I'm just forearms kind of resting and then just gently almost dragging my body forward because then I engage lap, lower traps and I find that length. A little bit more and I can release the grabbing in my because I get that grabby a little bit too I have to be really careful with that um, so then I can get a little more maybe just give me that sensation a little more leg and just activation down the side body to get the feeling here I mean the other thing that really works for me and when I teach long walks for example I'm always thinking about like shooting my belt out of can and I really think I use the side body to help me get length in the neck so that I don't end up grabbing. Otherwise, I kind of have a hard time not shortening to go with more big, powerful muscles. So I don't know if that also could be a helpful cue for that. All right. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time, but um, I think that was great. I love the sharing thing. I hope I don't know how you guys feel about it. You loved it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.
So, um, can we do the same thing next week? Would be okay with everyone? We did back and it actually included a lot of next, so maybe we'll just move to another part. Like, uh, how about foot? I've been wanting to go for foot for a while. Are you guys okay with foot for next week? And thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.